Following Christ's brutal scourging, Pilate appealed to the crowd for the final time. He presented Jesus, beaten and crowned with thorns, with the hope they might have mercy upon him. When Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns, Pilate said to them, Behold the man. The chief priests shouted, Crucify, crucify. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. And he handed Jesus over to be crucified. Now we have to understand that in the plan of God, all of this would fulfill what God had predicted in the future. The story of the crucifixion is not blamed on the Jews any more than it's blamed on the Romans and the Italians, uh, any more than it's blamed on Germans and Americans, because Jesus is going to the cross to die for the sins of all mankind, and it's our sins that nail him to the cross. These are merely the human players in the story, and the amazing thing is we would never remember who Pontius Pilate was. We would never remember who King Herod was. They would have been forgotten by the sands of time had their lives not intersected the life that really matters in the story, and that's the life of Jesus Christ. And he rises above the critics, the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests. He rises above the Roman governor until you are transfixed on one life, one savior, one man who is willing to die for the sins of the world because he is God incarnate in human flesh. Modern Jerusalem bears little resemblance to the city where Jesus suffered and died. In the wake of its turbulent history, Virtually all of its walls and buildings have been destroyed and reconstructed several times since the week of Christ's Passion. Yet today, pilgrims from throughout the world are still drawn to the narrow streets of the Eternal City to reflect upon a death unprecedented in its meaning, anguish, and prophetic significance. The crucifixion itself was designed by the Romans to extract maximum suffering. The streets going into the cities of Rome were often lined with crucified men as a warning to anybody who would dare to defy this political power. So it was designed to humiliate, to torture, to bring pain, and ultimately, over a period of days, to bring death. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which is called Golgotha. There, they crucified him. The crucifixion of Jesus is the foundation of Christian theology and the centerpiece of the Passion story. Since the third century, several locations in and around Jerusalem have been theorized to be the actual site where Christ died. The two most celebrated include the plot of land upon which the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was first constructed in 330 AD, and this barren outcropping of rock outside the northern wall of the city. While the Hebrew prophets made no attempt to identify the exact location of Christ's crucifixion, they did describe, often in precise detail, the events surrounding the death that changed history. It's important to understand that the description of the crucifixion in the ancient Hebrew writings takes place before crucifixion was even implemented as a method of torture and death by the Romans. When David wrote Psalm 22, crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet, hadn't even been thought of. It would have been considered inhumane 
in the ancient Middle East. And yet the Roman government decides this is one way when you've conquered a country to subjugate these people and keep them under authority, crucify as many as you have to, terrorize the population into submission. The actual term crucifixion is not used in the Old Testament. However, there are several ancient references that clearly indicate it was the means of capital punishment by which the Messiah would die. As a result, the fulfillment of messianic prophecy hinged upon a specific historical chronology. The Messiah has to come during the period of the Roman Empire. It's only in that narrow window of time when the Roman Empire rules the world that crucifixion is the means of execution and Jesus comes at the right time, dies the right way in fulfillment of those prophecies. David literally looks down through the halls of history, down through the corridor of time, and a thousand years in the distance sees the Savior suffering and dying and describes it for us in Psalm 22. Biblical scholars have long studied the correlation between the writings of David, Zechariah, and Isaiah, and the gospel accounts of Christ's death. When these Old and New Testament scriptures are compared side by side, the prophetic implications of the passion of Christ are fully realized. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. And they nailed Jesus to a cross. To intensify the pain of crucifixion, Roman soldiers attached victims to the cross by driving spikes five to seven inches long through the hands or wrists and feet. Like David, the prophet Zechariah foretold the wounds created by this torture centuries before the nails ever pierced Christ's body. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and mourn for him as one who mourns for an only child. Nine o'clock on Friday morning, the cross was raised at Golgotha. Pilate had a notice attached above Christ's head, proclaiming the charge against him in three languages. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 